Welcome to the 11th lecture in my series of lectures on understanding Bitcoin, part of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. This lecture is going to dive into Bitcoin security. Uh, so we'll talk about possession of Bitcoin, we'll talk about security principles, and we'll talk about user security uh, best practices. So you've probably heard the expression that possession is nine tenths of the law. Well, in Bitcoin, possession is sometimes referred to as 10 tenths of the law, you know, because Bitcoin is like digital cash or electronic gold. And it's not just a balance in a bank account. So whoever possesses the, the private keys to unlock the Bitcoin actually has control over the cash. It's like if they have the private keys, it's like they have the cash that was physically sitting in your wallet or was physically sitting in a bank. So you can lose your private keys, you can misplace your private keys, they can be stolen. You can even also accidentally give the wrong, wrong amount of Bitcoin to someone. In every one of those cases, uh, there's no way to get your Bitcoin back. It's just like you drop the Bitcoin on a public sidewalk. However, Bitcoin has some capabilities that cash and gold and bank accounts don't have. A Bitcoin wallet containing your private keys can be backed up like any file in a, in a file system. Um, you can store files in multiple copies. You can print them on paper for hard copy backup. Um, you can't back up a dollar bill. You can't back up a block of gold or a bank account. So Bitcoin is different enough from anything that's come before that we need to think about Bitcoin security uh, from a new perspective. So the core principle in Bitcoin from a security perspective is decentralization. And this has important implications for security, computer security. A centralized model, such as a traditional bank or payment network, depends on access control and vetting to keep bad actors out of the system. By comparison, a decentralized system like Bitcoin pushes the responsibility and control to the users. Because security in the network is based on proof of work, not access control, the network can be open and no encryption is required for Bitcoin traffic. So on a traditional payment network, such as a credit card system, you know, the payment is open-ended because it contains the user's private identifier, the credit card number. After the initial charge, anyone with access to the identifier can pull the funds and charge the owner again and again. Thus the payment network for a credit card system has to be secured end to end with encryption and has to ensure that no eavesdroppers or intermediaries can compromise the payment traffic in transit or when, it's just, or when the data and credit card numbers are stored at rest. If a bad actor gains access to the system, he or she can compromise current pay, credit card transactions and payment tokens that can be used to create new transactions. Worse, when customer data is compromised, the customers are exposed to identity theft and must take action to prevent fraudulent use of compromised accounts. So that's why we hear a lot about encryption um, for credit card systems. However, Bitcoin is dramatically different. A Bitcoin transaction authorizes only a specific value to a specific recipient and can't be forged or modified. It doesn't reveal private information such as the identities of parties and can't be used to authorize additional payments. Therefore, a Bitcoin payment doesn't need to be encrypted or protected from eavesdropping. In fact, you can broadcast Bitcoin transactions over open public channels such as unsecured Wi-Fi or Bluetooth with no loss to security. So Bitcoin's decentralized security model puts a lot of power in the hands of the users, but with that power comes responsibility for maintaining the secrecy of the private keys. For most users, maintaining secret private keys is not easy, especially on general purpose computing devices, such as internet connected smartphones or laptops. Although Bitcoin's decentralized model prevents the type of mass compromise we've seen with credit card hacks, Many users have problems adequately securing their private keys and get and watch as their private keys get hacked, as we'll talk about later. So how do we develop Bitcoin uh, systems securely? So the most important principle for Bitcoin developers, as I mentioned, is decentralization. Most developers, however, 
have been writing centralized security programs in the past and might try to apply centralized security models to their Bitcoin applications with unfortunate results. Uh, Bitcoin's security relies on decentralized control over the keys and on independent transaction validation by the miners. If you want to leverage Bitcoin security, you need to ensure that you remain within the Bitcoin security model. In simple terms, don't take control of keys away from the users and don't take transactions off the blockchain. For example, many early Bitcoin exchanges concentrated user funds in a hot wall of keys stored on a server. Such a design removes control from the users and centralizes control over the keys in a single system. Many of those systems were hacked and their Bitcoin was stolen. Another common mistake is to take transactions off the blockchain in an effort to reduce transaction fees or accelerate transaction processing. An off blockchain system will record transactions on an internal centralized ledger, ledger and only occasionally synchronize them to the Bitcoin blockchain. This practice again substitutes decentralized Bitcoin security with a proprietary and centralized approach. When transactions are off blockchain, improperly secured centralized ledgers can be falsified, diverting funds, and allowing the reserves to be stolen. So unless you're prepared to invest heavily in operational security, multiple layers of access control and audits, as the traditional banks do, you should think very carefully before taking funds outside of Bitcoin's centralized, decentralized security context. Even if you have the funds and discipline to implement a robust security model, such a design merely replicates the fragile model of traditional financial networks, which are pledged plagued by identity theft, corruption, and embezzlement. To take advantage of Bitcoin's unique decentralized security model, you have to avoid the temptation of centralized architectures that might feel familiar, but ultimately reduce the security you get from Bitcoin. So let's talk about the root of trust. Traditional security architecture is based upon a concept called the root of trust, which is a trusted core used as a foundation for the security of the overall system or application. Security architecture is developed around the root of trust as a series of concentric circles, like layers in an onion, extending trust outward from the center. Each layer builds upon the more trusted inner layer using access controls, digital signatures, encryption, and other security primitives. As software systems become more complicated, they're more likely to contain bugs, which make those systems vulnerable to security compromise. As a result, the more complicated a software system becomes, the harder that system is to secure. The root of trust concept ensures that most of the trust is placed within the least complicated part of the system and therefore least vulnerable parts of the system, while a more complicated software is layered around it. This security architecture is repeated at different scales, first establishing a root of trust within the hardware of a single system, then extending that root of trust throughout the operating system to higher level system services, and finally across many servers layered in concentric circles of diminishing trust. Bitcoin security architecture is different. In Bitcoin, the consensus system creates a trusted public ledger that is completely decentralized. A correctly validated blockchain uses a genesis block, uh, you know, that very first block that Satoshi Nakamoto wrote back in January 2009 as the root of trust, building a chain of trust up to the current block some 700,000 blocks later. Bitcoin systems can and should use the blockchain as their root of trust. So when designing a complex Bitcoin application that consists of services on many different systems, you should carefully examine the security architecture in order to ascertain where the trust is being placed. Ultimately, the only thing that should be explicitly trusted is a fully validated blockchain. If your application explicitly or implicitly vest trust in anything but the blockchain, that should be a source of concern because it introduces vulnerability.
a good method to evaluate the security architecture of your application is to consider each individual component and evaluate a hypothetical scenario where that component is completely compromised and under the control of a malicious hacker. Take each component of your application in turn and assess the impacts of the overall security if that component is compromised. If your application is no longer secure when components are compromised, that shows you've misplaced trust in those components. A Bitcoin application without vulnerabilities should be vulnerable only to a compromise of the Bitcoin consensus mechanism, meaning that its root of trust is based on the strongest part of the Bitcoin security architecture. The numerous examples of hacked Bitcoin exchanges, you know, underscore this point because those exchanges security architecture and design fails even under the most casual scrutiny. Those centralized implementations had invested trust explicitly in numerous components outside the Bitcoin blockchain, such as hot wallets, centralized ledger databases, vulnerable encryption keys, and similar schemes. So let's talk about some user security best practices. Human beings have used physical security controls for thousands of years. For example, uh, we built high walls. Then we put moats around the walls. We hired armed guards to walk the walls. Um, even in modern days, uh, if you look at a military base, it typically has guards. It typically has a fence around it. Maybe there's some dogs patrolling it. Um, maybe you've got cameras watching who's uh, approaching the fence. Um, by comparison, our experience with computer security is less than 50 years old. Modern general purpose operating systems are not very secure, and they're not particularly suited to storing electronic money. Our computers are constantly exposed to external threats uh, through the Internet. Um, our, you know, our systems run thousands of software components from hundreds of authors with unconstrained access to the user's files. You know, the basic Windows or Linux operating system ha has components that were written by a lot of different people. A single piece of rogue software among the thousands of so software components installed on your computer can compromise your keyboard, keyboard and files, stealing it, stealing it Bitcoin that's stored in wallets. The level of computer maintenance required to keep a computer virus free and Trojan free is beyond the skill level of all but a tiny minority of computer users. Even computer researchers who research computer security admit to being hacked from time to time. So despite, despite decades of research and advancements in information security, digital assets are vulnerable to a determined adversary. Even the most highly protected and restricted systems in financial services companies like banks, in intelligence agencies like the NSA and defense contractors are frequently breached. Bitcoin creates digital assets that have intrinsic value and can be stolen and diverted to new owners instantly and irre irrevocably. This creates a massive incentive for hackers. Uh, previously, hackers had to convert identity information or account tokens, such as credit cards and bank accounts, into value after compromising them. Despite the difficulty of fencing and laundering financial information, we've seen numerous thefts in the press. Bitcoin escalates this problem because it doesn't need to be fenced or laundered. The value is available as soon as the hacker gets access to your private keys. Fortunately, however, Bitcoin also creates incentives to improve computer security. Uh, whereas previously the risk of computer compromise was vague and indirect, Bitcoin makes that risk clear and obvious. Holding Bitcoin on a computer serves to focus the user's mind on the need for improved computer security. As a direct result of the increased adoption in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, we've seen an escalation in both offensive hacking techniques and defensive security solutions. In simple terms, hackers now have a, a very juicy target to obtain lots of currency through Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, and users have a clear incentive to defend themselves. Over the past several years, as a direct result of Bitcoin, we've seen a tremendous inf innovation in the realm of information and computer security in the form of hardware encryption, key storage and hardware wallets, multi-signature technology and digital escrow. So we're gonna dive into some of these topics. So let's talk about physical Bitcoin storage. Because many users are far more comfortable with physical security than information security, an effective method for protecting Bitcoins is to convert them into physical form. 
Bitcoin keys uh, you know, are nothing more than very long numbers. This means they can be stored in a physical format, such as printed on paper or etched on a metal coin. Securing the keys then becomes as simple as physically securing the printed copy of the keys. A set of Bitcoin keys is printed on number. Paper is called a paper wallet, and there are many free tools that can be used to create them. Keeping Bitcoin offline is called cold storage and is one of the most effective security techniques. A cold storage system is one where the keys are generated in an offline system, uh, one that's not connected to the internet, and stored offline either on paper or on digital media, such as a USB memory stick. Hardware wallets. Unlike a smartphone or a desktop, a hardware wallet has just one purpose, to hold Bitcoin securely. Uh, Without general purpose software to compromise with limited interfaces, hardware wallets deliver a very high level of security for non-expert users. Um, an example of hardware wallets are the Trezor and the Ledger. Let's talk about balancing risk. Although most users are rightfully concerned about Bitcoin theft, there's an even bigger risk. Data files get lost all the time. If they contain Bitcoin, the loss is much more painful. In the effort to secure Bitcoin wallets, users must be very careful to not go too far and end up losing the Bitcoin. Um, so there are many um, users who have lost hundreds or thousands of Bitcoin because they lost a password, or they lost an encryption key, and they were unable to access their Bitcoin. Um, here we got an example of a 2011 Bitcoin awareness and education project that lost 7,000 Bitcoin. I have another friend who claims to have lost uh, almost a thousand Bitcoin, and there's many others that you can find. Just do a search on lost Bitcoin online. So one thing to keep in mind is, you know, like hiding money by burying it in the desert, if you hide your Bitcoin too well, you might not be able to find it again. So don't hide your Bitcoin private keys so well that you can never find them again. So let's talk about diversifying risk. You know, would you carry your entire net worth in cash in your wallet? Most people would consider that reckless. Yet Bitcoin users often keep all their Bitcoin in a single wallet. Instead, users should spread the risk among multiple and different types of Bitcoin wallets. Prudent users might keep only a small amount of their Bitcoin in an online or mobile wallet for small transactions, kind of like pocket change. The rest should be split between several different storage mechanisms, such as desktop wallets and offline cold storage. Let's talk about multi-signatures and governance. Whenever a company or an individual stores large amounts of Bitcoins, they should consider using a multi-signature Bitcoin address. Multi-signature addresses secure funds by requiring a minimum number of signatures to make a payment. The signing key should be stored in different locations, under the control of different people. In a corporate environment, for example, the keys should be generated independently and held by several executives to ensure no single person can compromise the funds. Multi-signature addresses can also offer redundancy where a single person holds several keys that are stored in different locations. Let's talk about survivability. One important security consideration is often overlooked is availability especially in the context of incapacity or death of the key holder. Bitcoin users are told to use complicated passwords and keep their keys secure and private, not sharing them with anyone. Unfortunately, that practice makes it almost impossible for the user's family to recover funds if the user's not available to unlock them. In most cases, in fact, the families of Bitcoin users might be completely unaware of the existence of the Bitcoin funds. If you have a lot of Bitcoin, you should consider sharing access details with a trusted relative or lawyer. Um, you know, a complicated survivability scheme can be set up with multi-signature access and estate planning uh, through a lawyer specialized as a digital asset executor. You know, for example, it's quite possible that Satoshi Nakamoto uh, has passed away, the original founder of Bitcoin. Um, and he's rumored to have, you know, accumulated over a million Bitcoin while he was working on Bitcoin uh, and creating it. And so it's an open question as to whether his family estate actually contains the ability to access those million Bitcoin or not. 
So in conclusion, Bitcoin is a completely new and unprecedented and complicated technology. There are a lot of ongoing efforts to secure it. Um, and this was just a brief little lecture on security. Um, if you want to take a look at a detailed book that covers security, Bitcoin and blockchain security um, is a pretty good deep dive into security. Um, just to give you an example, chapter four on attacks talks about a number of different theoretical attacks on the Bitcoin blockchain and ways in which those attacks can be defended. So it talks about things like denial of service, selfish mining, um, ex you know, exploiting forks, um, how transactions are handled and where attacks can be made during the transaction process and so on. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about Bitcoin and blockchain security, I definitely recommend uh, the Bitcoin and blockchain security book. So um, this work is, is uh, licensed under Creative Commons attribution uh, and it includes content from the Mastering Bitcoin GitHub site by Andreas Antonopoulos, uh, which is also covered by the same license. Uh, and this video is covered by that license. I'd like to thank Andreas for making his content available under the Creative Commons license. Um, so again, thank you, thank you everyone for attending this uh, lecture on Bitcoin security, part of the Understanding Crypto uh, video series by Thomas Plunkett.